Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? Teague Moore knows what's going on. And if you're uh, at a loss right now and you're a parent who's just trying to get a kid in any level, NAIA, JUCO, NCAA Division One, Two, or Three, Teague Moore, the wrestling consultant, he's the go-to right now, former head coach at American and Clarion University. He's coached at Harvard, Oklahoma State. The guy's been around the block. He knows what's going on. He's a man, right? Biggest uh, biggest investment, biggest decision in your, in your, your child's life, so – you know, get some answers, get them before it's too late. Right. Oh, we got a dandy one tonight on the uh, barbarian hour. We have James Daniel Bergman, JD Bergman. Uh, are you junior? I'm not my, my, cause I'm not a true junior. My dad's middle name is different. What's his middle name? Marion. Marion. Pretty weird. James Marion. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't know always, that. Always been JD though. Okay. Your dad is one of 14. 12 are still alive, right? Wow, I should know that. Yeah, I know you should know that. But uh, your dad, well, uh, okay, so your dad, let's just get the, your dad is one of 14, eight boys, right. six girls. Yeah, eight eight boys, six girls. Yeah, two two uncles have passed. Yeah. Hank and? Bill. Bill. Bill was the oldest. Yes. Yeah, Bill was the oldest, and then I believe Hank was second or third, right? I think so. Yeah, okay, so Skip, Hank's Skip the oldest left. He's a doctor in Texas. Skip. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how about I don't know none of none of your aunt's names? No, I don't know a single aunt's name. I can name all eight guys because as you know, um most of them used to beat me up. <laughs> hey, hold on. Look, I gotta introduce you first so people know who you are. JD Bergman, uh a Multiple time U.S. national team member. <clears throat> JD doesn't know how many times he was on the U.S. national team. I put it at six, but from 2005 to 2015, he was top three, six or seven times. He doesn't know that number. You represent the United States in two world championships, 2011, 2010, uh, 10, and years. 10 and 13. 10 and 13. So t- 2010 and 2013. You were our U.S. national team member for the United States of America in the World Championships. Where were your World Championships, J.D.? Moscow and Budapest. Moscow and Budapest. I remember your dad posted the uh, picture. They went to this, like, enormous pool bathhouse deal. Oh, yeah. In Budapest, right? Yeah, bathhouses were pretty cool. Yeah, real cool. They got the sauna and all the, the outdoor pool, indoor pool, hot tub, all the stuff, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So super old Budapest, Hungary, 2011, 2013, man, you're sandwiched right between that Olympic year. And that was the Olympic year that Varner won. 2010, 2011, I tore a disc on my back in Belarus and I, I rehabbed back for the Olympic trials in 12 and messed up first round uh, and got third. Um, and then, and then 2013. So 10 and 13 were the two years uh, that I did my best in, in our country. Okay, so also you were a three-time NCAA All-American, runner-up once, runner-up at heavyweight, yeah, third and fourth at 197, mm-hmm. and then you were you were the last guy. You were the trivia question for a while. Lost first round as a true freshman and came back and took third. You were the trivia question there because that happens like once every five or ten years. But you were the trivia question for a while. The guy before you was Langy from Penn State, I believe. Who lost first round, came back and took third. Such a rare, hard route. What do you have to win? Five or six, six matches to do that? Seven. You have to win seven matches. You lose first round at the NCAs. You come back, you wrestle seven matches. What's crazy is I think I was the third or fourth guy to do it. And in, in history, from what I understand at the time, since then there's been some other guys. Yeah. Um, right, but yeah. my junior my junior year, I lost first round all three of my first years. And my junior year, I lost first round, and I came back to the third place match. If I would have won that and not taken fourth, I lost to Chris Weidman. Um, and in the last, I was winning in the last like 45 seconds or something. There's a story behind that that we don't need to get into now. But I lost to 
to uh, Chris and um, I got fourth, but, it, but that, and that stung bad. If I would have ended on third, I'd have been the only person to ever do that. Probably ever. Uh, when, well, yeah, that's probably never going to, I mean, that's hard to do. So hard to do. So, but you did it as a true freshman. You're the only true freshman to ever do it. I know that. That is wild. JD. That. Wild. So how many times did you win Fargo? Um, three. Three, once Greco, twi twice Greco, once freestyle? Yeah, I was finalist my junior and senior year in each one. And then I, I uh, got second in freestyle my junior year to Kish. Kish? Did you, so, you finally cracked the, the uh, Kish code in Fargo, though, didn't you? Yeah, in, in Greco, in Greco the, the week, the few days prior to that in Greco that year, our junior year. So, um, but yeah, so three, two in Greco. Okay, he's the head coach at North Dakota State University. You guys had a fierce rivalry in high school. In high school, you were high school national runner-up to Roger Kish. You won Fargo multiple times uh, in the juniors in freestyle and Greco. Uh, you were also a two-time state champ for Oak Harbor. And that, that's kind of like the original intent, you know, when I brought you on. We're both from Oak Harbor. Uh, you are being inducted into the Oak Harbor Athletic Hall of Fame this weekend, I believe. I think so, yeah. Uh, th that's his official name, but yeah, the Hall of Fame. Yeah, it's the Athletic Hall of Fame. Yeah, so the Athletic Hall of Fame, and you're probably the most accomplished athlete, and your Uncle George was your head coach mm -hmm. at Oak Harbor. George was my head coach. He coached all my brothers. He coached my nephew Ian. He coached my nephew Ian to a state title. He coached my nephew Wyatt to a state title last year. So we've got some pretty good family history. As you know, as people listen here, they're gonna get to really hear some humdinger Bergman Miller stories. Yeah, yeah, great, great wrestling families, uh, great families in general. Okay, of the eight Bergmans, only one of the eight Bergmans is your dad's generation. So George is the head coach at Oak Harbor. He was your head coach, my head coach, Hall of Fame head coach. It's coming whenever he. They might have to have him out there in a walker coaching. So um, he's had a couple of knee replacements, though. He's so he's bionic man. But of him and his, his seven brothers, there's eight of them, and your your dad, right? Yeah. How many of those guys were state champs or state placers? Probably should know that too. But I know my dad won in 1972. Uh, it was weird if he was in a different division, he would have wrestled Archie Griffin. Um, and um, really, yeah, yeah, same weight. One no way. One sixty-seven, I think. I think Archie won it in a different division, same year. Um, but uh, my at Uncle Joe, he was would, a placer. Joe yeah, was a placer. George was a placer. I would imagine John. John was a beast. Like, like he got disqualified one year. I know. Uh, I think he, like, he got called for slamming or something. Uh, I'm. I know Joe and and. Uh, George, I'd imagine. Yeah, um, George was a placer. And my uncle Chris, maybe? I, I don't actually oh, I know. I believe they're all placers for Cardinal Stretch, but I believe your uncle Hank went to St. Francis and Bill went to Central. or They didn't all go to Stretch, if you didn't know that. They, they didn't all wrestle either. And they all didn't wrestle, yeah. So I don't believe Skip, the doctor, wrestled. So, But you have a massive family. What is George told me the relationship? How are you guys related to Chris Everett? She is my dad's first cousin. From from your grandma. So I'm pretty sure her mom and my grandmother, my my dad, my dad and George's mother, um, is our, our sisters. Got so it. That's what it is. Chris is Chris's mom and and uh, my dad, my dad's mom are sisters. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you guys got just freak genetics, man. It's it is wild to think about it. You have a brother who's six foot six. My I guy he, Wes. Yeah, I'm listen, sure. listen I'm, I'm not gonna lie. I borderline bully Wes online because I think Wes can take it. Every oh, time Wes. there's a picture of Wes or anything of Wes comes up, I'm always just like Wes. <laughs> you Wes know that, right? Wes is Wes is highly underrated, probably. Um, Sneaky, he's funny too. He's very smart. I mean, he's very very smart. He has a lot of perspective of what's going on in the world, and uh, um, maybe too much at, at, at times. Um, but funny, like he, he uh, oftentimes is the funniest person that people meet. Like this guy's, you know, and he's just a really likable dude. So, um, he's under the radar. Mm -hmm. 
And then Paul, Paul just funny is, because he's kind of above the radar. Kid. Well, yeah, because he's massive. Hey, how about the year Wes placed in the state tournament? Yeah, he was a one fifty two punter at six foot six. Yeah, he wasn't that tall then. He he he, he grew still after after high school, <laughs> I think. But I know that he was six four. Oh, he was six. He was six four one forty a couple years earlier. Oh my god, he was one forty. And Dude, yes, he did looked, call, he looked you did, awful. You did call, it looked like they just stretched skin over bones. No, no, you called him Concentration Camp West is what you call him. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to lie to you. That may or may not have been a nickname that I had heard given to him. I don't know if I'm the originator of it. I think I am. But uh, he literally, like, all kidding aside, Wes looked like a malnourished person who was liberated at, like, I mean, dude, it was it – was, it was tough. Like I would see him, and I was like, "He looks he, terrible." He ran with it because he, um, uh, I mean, he would spladle and cradle guys, um, and they he would be getting double legged, and his feet would still be on the mat. Like, and they and those guys are standing straight up, and um, he he played his game. He eventually he went to Bowling Green, didn't wrestle his freshman year, transferred to Ohio State, wrestled behind Mikey Pasillo. No but way. when when Wes got a chance, when Wes got a chance to wrestle to start for Ohio State, uh, uh, I don't know, a few times, he wrestled Chris Honeycutt and lost him by one point. No way. Wes lost a one point match to Honeycutt? Yep. yep. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's like as opposite of a guy from Wes as you can get because Honeycutt's only like 5'9". Well, yeah, except like uh, like when Pasillo and – Pasillo wrestled Wes their uh, senior year. Or uh, Pasillo was younger, but when Wes was a senior, uh, Mikey, like, tech, tech followed him. That's the only guy that's ever tech followed Wes. Mike uh, Pasillo's special. At State. Yeah, yeah. Mike Mikey. Pasillo's special. There's just yeah. – that's all there's to say about that. And a guy I, I like, really enjoy, Mike Pasillo. Well, Wes got, Wes got fourth, fourth at State, and the number – the I think it was Cody – Birch or Cody Butzer, Butzer, uh, Pasillo, and somebody else. I mean, there was freaks. The, the one, two, and three spot. West did as the best he possibly could do, and I mean, state placer, man, it's cool. West is the man. I'm a big fan. Isn't Wes a high high stakes poker player? Uh, that's relative. He has. I don't think that's his. I don't think that's Reese Humphrey plays more high stakes than Wes. Wes plays poker, and he'll and well, comp, it's relative compared to who he plays two five. Um, and Wes Wes paid for his college online poker, and and um, he he does he does well, but he doesn't. He's not as risky as like Humphrey. Okay, hold on. The guy paid for college with poker. Stop diminishing his accomplishments. Yeah. Listen, Wes well, has I, been I, like I, the dirty kick around kid ever since i remember i remember he had the big stupid goggles growing up and your dad would be like wesley your dad would be like wesley go over here and he'd be screaming at west be like smacking him and i'm like oh man this dude's got a long road to go man he's got a long deal out of him but i think he's come out all right i like west i'm a big paul fan too all the stud yeah he's doing I a great love job. paul your brother paul how much what's the age difference between you and paul Cause you're in between. It's Paul, you. Yeah, my Paul. My, it goes Paul, JD, Wes, Rachel, Haley. That's the that's the all five order, right? Yeah, my mom was a champ. She had five kids in seven years, so she uh, she's still recovering. Um, so, uh, but yeah, Paul. Paul's just a year older, and Wes is a year younger. Okay, so you guys were boom, 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 three years right in a row graduating class. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, you guys are all wrestled at Oak Harbor, but you guys, did you ever go to junior high at Genoa? Because you grew up in Genoa. No, um, I moved to Oak Harbor in sixth, sixth grade. So okay. uh, we, never, we never went to Genoa schools. We lived in Genoa and went to St. Jerome Catholic School in Walbridge. And um, then we went from there, uh, which had like basically no computers. And I took my first computer class in sixth grade. I was the slowest one in the class. I never did AOL Instant Messenger. Uh, that's part of my story too. When I speak to schools now, like uh, computers have never been my favorite. Um, but um, anyway, uh, but yeah, I moved to Oak Harbor in sixth grade. So sixth grade, you guys grew up in Genoa. The family business, the paving business, is mm -hmm. in Genoa, Ohio. Still in Genoa, Ohio. 
Paul's the vice president and Wes is, Wes is working. So both my brothers and my cousins work for my dad's company and, and uh, they're, they're growing quite a bit. Actually, Paul's done a great job in leadership. Do they still put the pavement black side down? Uh, it's a joke. It's a joke. It was black side up, black side down. It's black. It doesn't matter where you put it. It's 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 asphalt. Pretty, it's yeah. pavement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like a, yeah, it's like an of, uncle an uncle Joe joke or something. That's a, how a lot of old car wrestlers would you know obviously you you included you know carrying two hundred three hundred degree buckets of tar and and uh, black topping and uh, yeah. Asphaltic cement. I would get like these lectures about how it's not tar, and I didn't care because it was hot and it could it could hurt you. Whatever. I'm like, okay, whatever you want me to call it, doesn't matter. But just real quick, you know, Paul's the man, Wes is the man. But you guys were little guys, little boys. You two were, you three were, and I was in high school. You guys were like middle schoolers, right? I remember I was a sophomore in high school, and I had a white Volkswagen, and I would park it out in the weeds. And there's like these pumps at Bergman's, your dad's company. Your grandpa founded it. Anyhow, great grandpa founded it. And yeah. uh, one day, Uncle John was whacking weeds. Anyhow, I was like, hey, Uncle, hey, hey John, how you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. How you doing? And I'm like, oh, oh good. Yeah, just long days going home, whacking some weeds, huh? Yeah, yeah, I'm whacking some weeds. And I was like, cool man and he like rolled up on me like pretty quick and he had his uh, uncle john had these crazy bowed legs i think he had to have surgery to have his legs straight like seriously right it, it, very bow-legged yeah very bow-legged anyhow uncle john your john <laughs> your dad's brother walks over to me and he hits me in the chest with the weed whacker and i'm like dude what are you doing then he just starts like hand fighting me smacking me pie facing me punching me and i'm like what are you doing i'm like get off me and i like chuck him and he tries to come after me again but he's all hobbled right so the dude basically like you know felonious assaulted me and i was like what are you doing why are you beating me up right now what is happening and I don't think you like the uh, pointing out that he had a weed whacker and he was weed whacking and doing a medial task that your dad or your Uncle Hank probably screamed at him to go do. So he did it. Or or he got done early with the dump truck and they were like, hey, go whack weeds if you're done. You know that's what happened. And the dude, I was just, I just happened to be the, the, uh, the uh, focus of his miscalculated and uh, ridiculous rage. He beat me up with a weed whacker. It was great. Dude, I remember you telling that story a long time ago. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I'm whacking weeds. You hit me with the weed whacker. I'm like, dude, why are, you, why are you beating me up right now? What's happening? Luckily, he was like a little feeble at that point. He was like starting to get older, and I think his knees were real bad. Because if he'd have been like healthy like 10 years earlier him, he'd have stomped a mud hole in me. He'd have beat the tar out of me. He'd have hurt me really bad, like probably broke my nose or something. Oh, it sucked. It was no fun. And I think they were in that, that you know, that Quan set, that half. Yeah. They were in that building laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a crazy story. Uh, he, it, it, there's, he had to, and I'm not super close with a lot of, a lot of my family because it's such a big family, but it, he had to have just thought you were being disrespectful and, and again, us uh, wrongly assuming that. Um, and, uh, maybe he wasn't in the best mood because he was asked to weed whack and he felt like that wasn't uh, honorable enough. I don't know. <laughs> I, have no idea. I caught the brunt of it. I can tell you that much. I got yeah. in my car and drove home. But also, also you and Pat, so Pat would ride with me. Kenya would go pick him up or he'd get dropped off at my house. And he would ride to Bergman's with me. So Pat and I would put the, uh, put it, put it black side up, <laughs> whatever they used to say, some ridiculous term. So Pat is also getting inducted into the O'Carver Hall of Fame. Is it you, oh, Pat, yeah, yeah. and Gary Quizno, right? Yeah, yeah. So Pat and I are 98 grads. What are you, 2002 or three? Three. So you're a three grad. So you are five years younger. Okay. So Pat and I would work for your Uncle Joe, and it was, dude, it was some of the most miserable, awful work you'd ever want to do. Did you guys ever have to go on the ceiling crew for Bergman's? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> 
I well, appreciate my life now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's funny. I do. I really do. So I, I can lose I, when I was definitely supposed to wrestle. I mean, God made me that way. I could lose 12 to 15 pounds in an hour and a half because I sweated so much. So imagine how, like, I'm like a polar bear in some capacity, but imagine that type of person in that weather dealing with that type of hot product. And on top, when I was in high school, before I had a healthy nervous system and everything, before I knew about like lower inflammation and in, in diet, I really enjoyed sugar quite a bit, still do. But um, I had such bad seasonal allergies, like, like my eyes and nose, just like in the, that heat, <laughs> it was, it was awful. Was runny, like, runny nose and eyes the whole time. Yeah. Just like, just itch, itchy and just uh, like allergies in a sauna, porn, porn sealer and stuff. Yeah. So you're, is it your, it's your great grandfather actually. Henry Bergman is your great grandfather. Yeah, 1912, they started it. Yeah. Okay. Pretty cool. And then and Aldo was your grandfather. Mm -hmm. And then Aldo was a Naval Academy grad, right? Yeah. Your George told me a story. Your grandma, grandma is what's grandma's what was grandma Aldo or Aldo's wife was Mary? She, but she went by Tommy. Okay. But, what was her name though? Um I'm not sure. Uh, Tommy. Okay. So grandma Tommy Bergman, right? She was at Pearl Harbor. Your grandpa was out yeah. on exercise. Uh, she, George told us she could see the guy's goggles. She could see the Japanese, the bombers. Oh, yeah. She could see the guys. Mm -hmm. She was like in the garden or something, doing something, and these planes just started dive bombing and destroying the island. Mm -hmm. Dude, how wild is that? Your grandma was at Pearl Harbor. And your grandpa was luckily out on exercise, or he right. probably would have been on one of those, the Arizona, or Utah, yeah. I think was one of them. He would have been on one of those ships that was sunk, Nevada. That, that's a crazy, like everyone can, knows what Pearl Harbor is, but what also is crazy, he was on a, a ship that was attacked at sea and was in the shark-infested waters. And like he, oh he, got, he got a purple heart, my, my grandpa did. Um, and he, he like probably should have died that time too. That's amazing. Um, he was like in shark infested water, people getting eaten and stuff like around him. And he was a Naval Academy grad. And what happens is they go and become officers. Did you beat a Naval Academy guy in like the NCAA semifinals or something when you're? Uh, Prendergast. Pren Prendergast. I think yeah, a Navy guy, right? Yeah. Good dude. Mm -hmm. oh, man, your, your grandfather, had he not passed away, would have been so ashamed of you. <laughs> <laughs> Aldo Bergman would have come up and slapped you. Yeah. It's right. crazy. That was a squad. But, like, you guys have, like, your family legacy is pretty incredible. What is the – with your daughter – your daughter is probably not even the youngest Bergman. <laughs> you guys operate with high volume. High volume, yeah. Is she, what number would she be? Do you know? Uh, from, from, like from – the, From the 14, the eight boys and the six girls. What uh, granddaughter would she be or great granddaughter? What number would she be cousin when I was like, because no, didn't you say you had over 95 cousins? No, no, I was wrong on that. I think I, I never said that. I, I used to think that there were like 70 some, but I think it's in the 60s in my first cousins, 60, 60 some first cousins. Well, it's well over 100 now with first cousins and then kids they have, right? For sure. Yeah, it'd be over 100, uh, definitely. Uh, wow. when it comes to, when and it comes then your to youngest sister. Was the first one to have kids, right? Yeah, she has three beautiful girls, and uh, um, and she married Brian Wolf, who uh, wrestled at Mercyhurst and wrestled at Saint Anne's before that, who was like my older brother's best friend. So they they have a real cool setup in Avon Lake, and oh, they're in and, Avon um, Lake on West Side, huh? Mm -hmm. Nice. Do you ever get up to the West Side? Yeah, I get, uh, sometimes go up there. Um, but yeah, we just had a really cool birthday party for the girls uh, a couple months ago. All right, so we talk family. We talk about all these different things. So you, you're getting inducted into the Hall of Fame. We'll come back to that because you were, uh, you had all of O'Carver's records as a tailback, which I, a lot of people don't look at J.D. Bergman and think tailback. You know, and say finalist at heavyweight, 96 kilo world team member multiple times. Right? They don't think running back, but that we'll get into that running back and your your thoroughbred, uh, I guess, running skills, <laughs> <laughs> plowing through people and murdering them, uh, but. Let's talk about what you've done. 2016 was your last quad, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You battled injuries the whole time from high school. You missed a year of high school as a sophomore. I think you broke your back. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've had injuries. It's just, you've battled injuries. You've battled your body for years. 2016 was when you retired. What have you been doing since 2016? It's 2021. What has J.D. Bergman been up to? Man, there's a lot. Uh, but in short, we'll start like high level and then whatever, we, wherever we want to take this conversation. But um, I was pursuing speaking professionally and realized that travel schedule was going to be tough because I was about to get married. And my wife is highly relational, as most women are. And, and she didn't like the idea of me traveling to speak to high schools and stuff all over the place. So um, it's a long story, but through a thin thread, I, I am borderline stalked a very wealthy couple that's changed my entire life. And uh, they're, they've been teaching, they, they've been teaching my, my wife and I wealth mentality, habit development, passive income development. And it's taken over three years, but we got my wife home from corporate America, which is a dream for us, uh, helped us get debt free before that. And so that's given me some flexibility. Um, and actually from 2016 to 2019, um, it's kind of crazy, but I, I pursued an idea that I felt God gave me, uh, which again, some people relate to that, some people don't, but I got my first, let me backtrack. I got my first computer in 2013. I graduated from Ohio state in 2008. I used computer labs and borrowed in, in college. If I needed to write something or type something or whatever, I was the last person to get a smartphone in my friend network. The fact that from 2016, to 2019, I was building what we had ambitions of being a safe social media platform that had mental health focus. Uh, all of Buckeye Nation pretty much is on there. There's five or 600 videos. It's at inteamnow.com. Right now, it's really heavily Christian focused uh, as far as like gathering stories from Christian athletes, but all the content is stories, not religion, not like, so basically how have you overcome something? People record that under two minutes. And I worked on that for three years, thought it was going to blow up and really had ton of traction uh talking to some of the biggest names in sports about that basically the idea was to use athlete stories to motivate kids and ha give them a kind of a hub on their phone that they could go to for hope and inspiration um but we never got we never took off so i um was running a gym for a little while and uh, then i was in stem cell therapy uh which was a passion of mine because stem cell therapy done right, which the FDA doesn't want people healthy. So um, it's kind of harder and harder to find it done right. Um, it, it literally helped my dad avoid a knee replacement. It's like, it's helped my knee. Uh, anyway, um, that, that office uh, essentially was taking a nosedive with COVID. So I'm actually now in commercial HVAC rentals. Uh, so we do like highly customized at HVAC, um, highly engineered setups for construction projects, temp all temporary or emergency setups while permanent units getting fixed. It's enjoyable building relationships. I'm, I'm uh, looking to, um, you know, grow that quite a bit, but in my evenings, my wife and I are really, really passionate about helping millennials learn wealth mentality because we're not taught anything about how to be successful, how to have a strong marriage, how to be a good parent. So we're big on leadership development, personal development. So that kind of encompasses, I still do some speaking, but I'll do a lot more in the future when I have more flexibility. Social media wise, how much of a battle do you figure out? Like, when did you figure out the battle you were fighting against the real versus, cause you know, the Instagram's got the real, they'll suck you in, man. It's like a black hole. Yeah. All of them have these just, and we do, you and I had a conversation off, off uh, air it, it is designed, we know this, it is not like we're crazy tinfoil hat guys. It's designed yeah. to be used as, to be addictive. Yeah. And it's designed to never end. They want your face in the phone the whole time. Mm -hmm. And they want to sell your metadata. They want to sell what you're looking at, what your eyeballs are on, what you're looking at the most. And those companies then start to target you. And you know, a lot of people are like, man, I was just thinking about that. Oh man, I would watch a couple of videos. Now all of a sudden I'm getting targeted by this, that, or the other, right? I, and everybody, and people thought that was serendipity for the longest time, right? It's not, it's not at all. No. So, I mean, there's a lot, a lot to that. Um, again, starting from a high level, we can work down wherever you want to go, but um, I got, so getting around really wealthy people that, that have hearts, to restore the family dynamic in our country that, that think about 
I've never heard anyone talk about reverse tithing, like giving 90% of your income away and living off 10% comfortably. I've never heard people talk like that until the last handful of years. I basically got rid of my TV. Now, this is someone that has an acting, sports broadcasting. I was pursuing acting at one point in time. I've been in a couple of movies. I got rid of my TV cold turkey. Were you in a, were you in a fox catcher? Yeah. So there's some what funny one. We can circle back. You wouldn't know the other one. It, uh, I don't even remember the title. It's a small, small family. Okay. Okay, keep going. Shot in Lima, actually. Uh, but um, I cold turkey got rid of my TV, um, and I started studying neuroscience and what's going on in our culture because I lost two friends of suicide in five days. I, I've lost other friends of suicide outside of those two. And I was like, what's going on? We won the geographical lottery living in America. Why, why is anxiety, depression, and suicide skyrocketing? And on the health side, why has cancer, diabetes, obesity never been higher? Um, so I started connecting these dots and realizing – man, there's actually systems in place that have good people working within them that are set up to make people sick and debt and busy their whole life. And uh, what I realized is, man, there's it. And if people are always sick and debt and busy, how do you love your neighbor? How do you help somebody else? How do you find out why you're really here? And it's about control. It's about stealing time. And, and uh, so I started studying kind of like what's going on neurologically and people, they don't even know it, but the brain scientifically is designed, uh, you know, for deep, sustained thought and most americans aren't getting any of that therefore their brains kind of with all the images they're taking in all the yeah. i call this uh thumb workouts on the self-image erosion tools uh they take in uh they take in so Accurate. much they take in so much of the world they turn their brain into a pinball machine therefore they actually never never dip into critical thought and they can really be swayed by their emotions which are not good indicators of truth um or anyway so I was, I was learning I'll, everything you just said is true, by the way. Yeah. And, and so I'm well, the truth doesn't stutter, you know, and I, I, I love people so much uh, to the point where even fast forward to today, I've learned so many things. I became a reader. I had a learning disability I was diagnosed with. I never finished a test on time in my entire life. I never thought I would get rid of TV and I never thought I'd be a reader until I realized it doesn't matter if you like the results that reading gives you. It matters if you like the results or I'm sorry, it doesn't matter if you like the like to do something it matters if you like the results so um the average billionaire reads 70 books a year i was reading zero i've i've sub so changed that and um anyways i want to be financially independent as soon as i possibly can be so that i can help more people because like learn the thought the the thoughts that are in napoleon hill Dale carnegie kiyosaki all these books that were not given in school on purpose and school now as we've seen is teaching us how to be dumber getting a whole bunch of debt and being a huge hole our whole life um, so I'll get off my soapbox. You're, nail, you're nailing it right now. You're nailing it. So, so I got a new job. I, I guess I, I should tell you about my new job. You're telling me about your ventures. Mm -hmm. So we are focusing more on a career-based curriculum and a work-based learning. Uh, that we're going to start to give different paths to graduation in the state of where we are. And we want kids to start to integrate work-based learning, pre-internships, internships, uh, you know, apprenticeships whatever we can on the job right yeah we want because not everybody's a college grad look at a lot of the guys who are working at bergman's they're not designed to be college grads Co being a college grad doesn't make you there's actually no correlation to higher education higher paycheck not not at all like some of the most successful people have didn't graduate college um, I mean, or bill gates or you know bill. we can sit and go through all of them right like yeah, Bill Gates. There are a lot of those people are anomalies, though. You know, like they're anomalies. They're they're yeah. freaks. We get they you and I get that, right? They might have been hand selected. Uh, yeah, but they're freaks. So, so, yeah, but but what I would say, if people, anybody listen to this, if kids do not know what they want to pursue, do not go to college. That's a terrible financial decision. I don't care if it's sexy and that's the thing your parents want you to do. It's a terrible financial decision unless you know exactly what you want to do. If you want to be a nurse or you want to be a lawyer and you and you need the degree, absolutely, you have to go that route. But um, man, start making money and get some experience. Do what you're talking about, the trades, like do something. And then you can always go to school. Uh, you don't have to just dive into student loan debt with no clear path. It's wild to think about it because in 2003, four, five, six, seven, eight, that was my mindset. Like I felt like every kid had to go to college because that was what I was indoctrinated with at Kent mm -hmm. State, right? Right. Now, fast forward, I'm back at Kent State 2021, and I'm in a totally different, I'm in a totally different 
path now, now that we understand kids' paths need to be different, right? Like there are kids who are workforce kids, right? There are kids who are going to go put the black stuff black side up, right? They're going to go do, they're going to go do asphalt. They're going to go do roofing. They're going to go, you know what I mean? Like that, that is okay. And I, I think for the longest time we were selling this like American dream had to have college tied to it. And, and you and I fell for it, right? I mean, you went to Ohio state, you were on a football team, you know, you wrestled made the NSA finals three time all American. And it was all tied to a scholarship, right? I went to Kent state. I used wrestling to get me through high, you know, through college. And we kind of lived that. But I mean, it was what I, I'm glad I did it. I'm, I have zero regrets. I'm guessing you probably don't have any regrets either, but I can't speak for you. But that's what it's all tied to. Everything's tied to, hey, go to college. It makes a better life for you, right? Like that's what we've been told. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, now what college is, I mean, this has been decades and decades in the making, but now what colleges are doing to indoctrinate kids away from family values and away from, um, a lot of like things that are what I would say is truth. And this is not a political statement. This is just like there, this is a, it's a breeding ground for unraveling um, foundational like morality. And um, uh, again, that's relative to, to whoever's what uh, direction you're looking at there. But yeah, anyways, I just think there's so many, there's way more cons to pros in college as, as a, just a default to have their next step after high school. Um, so my daughter at this point, unless she wants to be an athlete, or pursue something specific, she's not going to college. She'll be she'll be financially independent in her early twenties. Uh, I from because I know what I'm going to pass down to her. I think like another thing is we need to teach more financial literacy, sure, basic economics, and that's that's awesome. They're kind of letting me do that in my new class that I'm teaching. I'm teaching a career exploration class. I'm teaching uh, kind of a, a mishmash of it second semester for a career-based intervention. And it's awesome. And I feel so confident and good about it. Cause you know, you see, if you look at like a lot of memes or whatever, like the, 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 the mind pinball stuff, if you go on some of the, the, the Instagrams and the, the Facebooks, Oh, they never taught us about what a credit score was. They never taught us about checks, this, that, the other, right? Like they don't, they never, because, because they are not teaching kids that they're not teaching kids to be responsible for, that they're going to pay back three times on a 5% loan of a mortgage. You know, you buy a hundred thousand dollar house, you're paying $300,000 back. Right. Just basic things like that. That's like basic, right? It's very basic, right? People borrow money and then they pay three times back to the bank. Am I wrong? No. That's what happens. Nobody knows that. A mortgage, like you knew it. I knew like it. Mortgage, like where mortgage like translates to like death grip mortgage like yes yes no you're stuck in this thing for 30 years yeah dude i just refinanced it cuts seven years off the mortgage i'm like what <laughs> it's crazy it's like like you're saying it's like death grip right well, the, the cool thing grip. is i i like to like i use humor and and uh questions to help people like start to think and then um and then I do share some, some stuff, but then I have a, like, Hey, there's actually hope, you know, it, it, we can talk about all the bad things that are going on and we, and we should help people become aware of it, but then, okay, w what's the answer then? Well, you've got to get around people that have fruit on the tree in their life. Be careful taking advice from people. I always, I always challenge uh, millennials, like if, unless they ha check the agenda and the credibility before you take that advice, they could love you. They could care about you, but if they're not, if, they, if, they, if they've been a divorce three times, you can still love and respect them. But if they're trying to give you marriage advice, not a great place to be getting it, right? Same thing, like broke people listen to broke people all the time. Like I, I love uh, dozens of financial planner friends of mine, but a financial planner can't help you become financially independent. If they knew how, they wouldn't be stressed out five days a week. Fair, fair statement. I, now, now, now a financial planner can help you with your investments for sure. And uh, I... Anyway, um, just, I, that's a tangent, but what's wrong with that tangent? That's what you're doing now though. That's like what your passion is and what you're moving towards. But so here, how does a gravel eater, how does a pavement company road construction, how does a guy who comes from a, you know, your dad's from 14 kids, right? You got this massive family, you got five kids in your family. 
you did a row construction, you did ceiling, you did all, you did manual labor. Like there's no finessing anybody at Bergman's. <laughs> You're not going in there and tricking anybody to go fill cracks for you. You're not finessing anybody to go, uh, you know, lay the pavement down, right? And run the steamroller over it. You're not doing that, right? You're not finessing Paul in the much, I'm guessing. Where do you guys get this? Where do you guys think you guys get this from? Like, how does a guy go from, I don't want my kids to be in road construction. I want them to be running the company, owning the company. I want them to be financially giving people advice. I want them to be a speaker. How do, how do you think your dad prepared you guys not to work at Bergman's and put the stuff black side up? Well, my brothers are working there. Okay. Um, okay. But, are your but, brothers going laying the black stuff down? Um, no, they're, they're, they're leading teams. Uh, yeah, you get my point, right? Uh, yeah. Well, they both, my brothers both went to college and they, and so there are, there are some pros to college as well. Uh, they both wrestled in college. They have that work ethic instilled. Um, you've got also just, I think a part of that is, is from the sport of wrestling, right? I mean, you have, you have, uh, certain traits that have happened over years. My dad is, uh, very humble, uh, you know, we never talked about his accomplishments or anything, really. Uh, you got to pry some of that stuff out of him. And and very, very much of a server, too. Uh, he, he he always was buying people's stuff when we do these road trips and stuff. And he's always, um, but I think my dad's a pretty good leader. And um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think for me, I mean, my path took me all around, all around the world. And, and uh, I got a chance to get around. I, I, I'm very coachable i've heard so i i don't have pride in things like jay you suck at basketball well, i've never played basketball i don't care that i suck at basketball i can get some boards you know but i i'm terrible at <laughs> basketball that's not my thing i don't have any i don't have pride in things i hey you suck at speaking russian well, yeah sure <laughs> i don't speak russian but like but like uh when it but i'm coachable so when i get around people that are very successful i you know i'm i fascinated by successful entrepreneurs so i just kept getting around the heat associations huge and then guarding my eye gates and ear gates of the last five years has been huge i only taking in as much truth as i possibly can filtering out the noise um so that's for me personally uh but i think my dad's a great leader and um it's cool to see paul and west kind of help and grow henry w bergman like they actually doubled doubled the company i think in the last I don't know how many years. Can we talk about your dad's wardrobe heat? Can we talk about your dad's oh. dashiki at the 2012? <laughs> the Dude, 2012 Olympics. Remember he rolled up on me in the dashiki and I like lost my mind? Yeah. He, <laughs> he, one, one of his best friends, one of his best friends is Dinesh Katari from India. Oh. And, and uh, yeah, my dad, my dad and mom are not shy. Uh, and my dad's funny. I mean, he's like, just, I mean, I remember just going through drive throughs and stuff and he, he would, uh, he'd ask certain questions, always making, making people smile, you know? Um, and, uh, his outfits do it for me. He's worn some yeah. like places where he's gone and traveled like ethnic, ethnic outfits. And I'm like, dude, where did you get that? A crazy. Got, what, what are you talking about? I got this from India. This is from my friend. Yeah. Yeah. It was literally like a dashiki, wasn't it? I don't even know what that exactly is, but like, yeah, like whatever the Indian garb, like the long, long robe looking outfit. What it is? Google it. I just did. What it is? He was <laughs> rocking it. He was so proud of it. Oh man, it was that hard being in London 2012 for you? Like, it didn't seem like it was hard. It didn't seem like you were like, ah, my heart's broke. You weren't over like kicking rocks and punching scoreboards you weren't mad about it you were happy to be there to support Terval and all the team USA right yeah dude I mean I freaking love Terval that was my dude like we were couldn't be any closer uh it was crazy sad how that tournament went for him and was I was it like a weird well I mean and first of all to answer your question I am usually always in a good mood because I understand perspective and you know, there's always first world problems that are distractions. Like, no, no. Yeah. I wasn't at the Olympic team when I felt like that was my spot. I was four and against the guy that wins the goal. And obviously he had a pretty interesting track to get, yeah. you know, yes, Donnie blows his ACL and, and whatever, but, but beats, but beats could in the process. 
Right, right. So, but 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 still, not to take anything away from him, like he won the the gold medal, and at that point in time, I was four zero against him, and and uh, you know uh, whatever. I don't I don't want people hearing this and think, well, it should have been, we could have, should have, could have, would have. Like it wasn't, but like why, no, why do you why, okay? Sidebar. It is a wrestling podcast. Mm-hmm. Why were you so successful? Why did you have a four zero run over a couple years over Jake freaking Varner? Why were you so that guy's powerful. How were you able to beat that guy on such a consistent basis? JD Bergman, there. I mean, dude, you beat him. Would you beat him two zero in Cleveland? Two two matches zero, right? To get on the world team, right? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you could look up the scores of the the four times we wrestled. Uh, the first four times we wrestled. Well, here's let's let's back up. Jake Varner is the guy, and if you don't win the NCAA tournament, you're not that good in wrestling in in most people's eyes. Now you know more about wrestling, so I never won the. I never won. I could have wrestled 197 my senior year and Phil Davis won it and like whatever I had a good run against Phil Davis, but I'm so glad I went heavyweight by the way, way more fun. If you're, if you weigh 225, freaking don't cut weight, just go heavyweight. Uh, in my dude, opinion, are you under 200 pounds right now? You look great. Dude, I weigh 250 right now. You weigh so. 250? Yeah. There's yeah. no way. Cause I weigh 250. I, I look I, like chewed bubble gum. You look like not dad bod. You'd still, you look pretty good, dude. I, I have like I have like a soup can for my like my uh my rib cage to my my thighs like I'm real dense but uh uh but so what here's inter- what's interesting like how do you do that like people are I don't know their their perspectives are so skewed in wrestling unfortunately because of the sport of wrestling we've gotten better but there's not a lot of real good understanding like oh my gosh like when people find out uh, Kyle Snyder was my training partner or or I was his training partner like oh my gosh, like they look at me like, how did you survive? And they don't, they don't have an understanding. Like you, you're one second away from like in matches, right? They don't understand how elite the, the sport gets. And so in 2009, I respected Andy Rovet, who's a good friend of mine because he was Olympian. Love Andy Rovet, by the way. Love well, him. Dude, Andy Love is him. Great. He the, lives I, up here. Hey, he lives up here. He lives about half hour from me. But he's side. I, but here's here, – and, again, I'll write a book one day because I think people will be really interested in this. I never should have lost to Andy Rovat if I actually would have just wrestled. And my biggest – more than injuries was my mind in the sport of wrestling. I, if I would could just take the governor off and allow, allow myself to wrestle at the highest capacity and not have nerves or, or too much respect or not enough respect – so Varner makes a team in 2009. I was for sure whoever won between me and Rovat would make that team. And what, happen, what happens was Varner, who's still in college, makes a team in 2009, goes to world championships. And then I finally have a chance to wrestle Varner in 2010, and it's not close. I never imagined it would be close. He's younger than me. I've always been the best guy in my, in my weight class. I never imagined a younger guy. No, like everyone was surprised by that. But I don't, in my opinion, in my perspective, that should never. 2011, I tear a disc on my back. He makes the team again, goes to the world championships. 2012, I, I totally overlooked Chris Pendleton. And I lost first round at the Olympic trials after 17 years of wrestling. And that was my Olympic team. Like that's the, that's the, I, I thought I was going to retire after my fourth, my fourth knee surgery in 2008, when I was trying to beat Daniel Cormier to make the team in 2008, I was trying to sneak on the Olympic team in 2008. Uh, and um, not to say that I would have beat Daniel, but I, I lost him by a point And I was, I was, I thought that I could have, and I cut all this weight after heavyweight. I lost 30 pounds in like three weeks. I was smashing people to the U.S. Open, and then I blew my uh, good knee out. And I thought I was going to retire, but I prayed a lot about it, got perspective, and I was like, I, I got to do this. I want to be the best in the world in wrestling. I did a pretty good job in 2010. Tore a disc my back in Belarus. They said I, I would never – they said I probably wouldn't walk or be able to play with my kids if I don't get a back surgery. But I had learned enough about how God created the body to heal, and I didn't get that back surgery. Howie Long was in the waiting room. I was out in California. This guy was going to treat me for free, tra- takes her Olympic athletes. 2012, I freaking blew it, and I got third at the Olympic trials. And the guy that I'm 4-0 against wins the Olympic gold medal. 2013, I'm back. The, 2013, I was the most focused I'd ever been with my nutrition. I weighed 219 pounds, and I felt like I could physically remove somebody's head off their body. I thought it, was, it wasn't even fair. Um, I wish Varner would have wrestled in 2013. I don't know why I haven't said that. That's like deep within me or something. Like, because uh, it wouldn't have been close again. 2014, I freaking blew it. Lost to uh, Kale Byers, I think, first round. Again, these Kale first round. Kale Byers beat you? First round, first round at the Olympic trials. And I come back. No, and get, the Alaska dude beat you. Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, he's from Alaska. George Mason, right? Um, he wrestled at Oklahoma State. And then State. Oklahoma State. 
Okay. But, but so, so, and then 2015, I lose to somebody. Oh, 2015 is that the, what I talked about, like I lost to, uh, I was winning two zero, 10 seconds left. Barner super ducks me. I lose two to two on criteria. My training partner, Kyle Snyder wins the U S open in 2015. So all these like near misses, um, Kyle ends up winning the world. I, if I was a guy sitting out, I would have probably had Kyle. I, I've had to beat Varner, which I should have 10 seconds. Anyway, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. But like, but then now, like, like, anyway, all I, the shoulda, woulda, couldas of it though. Right. Yeah. Like I, I know him, right. Cause you're, we're from the same hometown and I have a, you know, personal relationship with you knowing you since you were a little guy, your uncle's my high school coach, still coaching my nephews. It's wild to think about how far we go back. Right. Uh, but what is wild to me is you're always just right there, man. But the other thing about it is to me is you're not losing any sleep over it. That's just my opinion. My, my observation of you is you're not going to go and like stay up all night and beat yourself up about the things we talked about tonight. No, is that I a mean, fair statement? Dude, I love the sport of wrestling. It's by far the best sport and I'm trying to be as unbiased as possible. I think it's the best sport in so many ways as far as what it does to people. But relatively speaking, let me, let me go one layer before I say this comment so that people are prepared for it. Coach Trestle is a good friend of mine. Coach Trestle, uh, he said this more than once. I've heard him say this in a room. I was emceeing this event with coach Trestle. Well, coach Trestle was one of the speakers, Barry Sanders is in the room, Archie Griffin, uh, all these NFL guys, the who's who, uh, of, of Ohio State football. Uh, we were, we were doing a fundraiser for William White and, um, coach Trestle said, Hey, uh, Raymond Harris, uh, how many, how many uh, people are there in the, in the world? About 7 billion. Right. Um, and then, and then, um, he said, okay, well, that means that 6.7 billion people think that football is soccer. So, so that's, that's how little the NFL is, right? Relatively no. speaking. No, yeah. well, let, me, let me take it further. No one cares about wrestling in America in comparison to Iran and Russia. I, I, if, I would have re- if I would have been in Iran and Russia, um, like I would have been a millionaire. And, and whatever. But here's what's interesting. I love the sport of wrestling. It prepared me for this stage of my life. And, and relatively speaking, sports are huge, but too many parents are chauffeurs to their kids and they're losing their marriage. I don't care about sports, relatively speaking, to what really matters in life. And I've, I have a heart to, to um, help people get on a, a train track so their life will be better in five years. And I've realized there's so much good that comes from sports, but there's a tipping point. If you get more excited for your sports team than you do for your, your marriage or, or uh, your future, there's, there's something off there and we're so distracted by it too. So no, I'm not beating myself about wrestling. Cause it, I mean, it's still, you can tell, it's still kind of like bothers me that I, that I didn't have a greater outcome not to put down. I know that I had relatively speaking a good wrestling career, but I knew that there was so much more and I, I, I rationalized sometimes and, and Kyle Snyder is a great example. He was always getting better and I was maintaining, I was trying to be healthy. If I, if I, if I was in shape and healthy, I thought I was always going to be the guy, but um, you were here. You were just trying not to be hurt. He was doing this the whole time. Yeah, for sure. Your trajectory was just up. Yeah, it was just up. And, and you knew that. And it was like, what was crazy was, I don't think he was, he wasn't dude he was beating everybody else up as he, even as his trajectory was going up i think he had like a big brother thing on him now yeah i mean i yeah i wrestled kyle like for three years and and we and in 2015 you know it's a big if but if if i uh don't lose to varner in the semis I, it's it's very highly likely I, kyle's not making that team but what's so cool is I, 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 he blew my mind when he not only made not, 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 not I knew he could beat Varner. I, I, I wrestled with him enough. I, I thought he could beat Varner, but when he won the worlds, I mean, he's, he, I mean, I was, I was ecstatic for him. I was just like, oh, I could, I could have lived. I don't, I wouldn't have beat Gadisov. I don't, I don't think. I was just I, gonna say, do you think you could? Because Gadisov's a freak, dude. No, no, I, I don't freak. think. I saw, I saw Gadisov like smash herbert and like do like do some crazy russian things i i didn't have the mental capacity to to where i don't think i would have beat him not because i i wasn't gifted enough to maybe figure something out to to beat him from an athletic like gifting standpoint like i think he's more athletic and whatever but i think my mental i wasn't mentally ready to beat him are you a snyder hater 
he left and a lot of people in Columbus, Ohio and the greater Columbus area and Ohio in general are very sore for Kyle Snyder moving to state college to be a part of the Nittany Lion Wrestling Club. Coach, you know, Sanderson Brothers, C- Coach Cunningham, Varner over there, excellent coaching staff. We all know that. Mm-hmm. David Taylor is a training partner and Olympic gold medalist, another Ohio guy. Are you a Kyle, uh, Kyle Snyder hater? Are you still a Kyle Snyder lover and believer? No, no. I, I love Kyle uh, and always have, likely always will. Um, and uh, but it w- it was odd, like the letter what a re- that originally came out. You know, it, I thought it was worded in, in an interesting way that kind of um, articulated like Penn State being a better training environment instead of like talking about. I'm pretty sure that his wife was getting into medical school over there. He was from Maryland, you know, so he could have worded it in a different way of like his reasoning for going. But you know, uh, I I don't know because we we were not super, super close when I finished wrestling. I've been head down, like looking to help as many people as I possibly can. And I've been really, really developing myself so that I can be more impactful as a leader. But um, I've been a little bit unplugged besides doing some sports, sports broadcasting for wrestling. Uh, So um, it was surprising to me. I don't think anybody knew about it. So he, he did, he, I mean, I don't know, but no, no, I I mean, Kyle's a a friend of mine. We don't talk often, but I look to see, look for him to do well. Um, But yeah. Sad you live. Can't what is the Sad you live is a generational talent for Russia, right? Um the last two matches, uh Sad you live has, has controlled them and I think he caught him with that back back hook. That like weird little dump back hook he hit him with when he pinned him in the worlds, right? Yeah. Yeah. What has he got to do in your opinion? You know, you're an elite guy, you're a multiple time world team member. <laughs> Dude, anybody knows what, what it takes to wrestle at that level is you. What does he have to do to that guy? And that, once again, that guy's a generational talent. That guy's a mutant. That guy's in the Satya of conversation, the Medved, the Fedzayev conversation, the Belaglazov conversation, uh, got Solov conversation. I can keep going. I don't have enough time because there's so many great Russians. But that guy's in every – he's every bit at everybody's level I just said, right? How does Kyle yeah. beat him like he beat him in 2017 in Paris? Yeah, I think he's only lost one match since 2014. 13, and that was- 13, 13. 2013. So he's lost one international match, and that was to Kyle um, the first time they wrestled because he, he wasn't ready for Kyle's conditioning and and, uh, and beef, you know. Uh, but um, that's, that's a question that maybe would be better fielded by someone that has more wrestling. Uh- but I asked you. But I, I asked you. I asked you, you know what it takes. What does he got to do to close the gap on that guy? Or do you take, more, do you take more shots and the guy picks you apart? Like my thing is like, everybody's got, everybody wants to talk about Kyle Snyder and oh, he's not as good as that guy and this, that, and the other. And he beat that guy. and He's never going to beat that guy. And the guy's widening the gap, right? Like my thing is I'm still a Kyle Snyder guy. I'm just like, I, I want Kyle Snyder to win. I'm an American. I'm a homer. I want that guy to win. When I look at it, he's got to get to the guy's legs. He's got to get to the guy's legs. He has, yeah, and, even if he's not scoring, he's picking the guy's leg up and pushing him out. He's well, got to get to the guy's legs. Clearly, at the Olympics, he um, he needed to uh, change off like way faster. But at the same time, you're dealing with that level of an athlete that that was so trained on that uh, uh, chest lock position. I, you have if you're going to get to those get to the leg, you have to finish yesterday you i mean you have to finish in a split second so the chain the chain wrestling you're not going to score uh on schedule live with with one one like one movement you're going to have to do a chain that has been you're going to have to like chess piece your way to um being better in positions than he is and he's and that's very very difficult but it's definitely guy in the world period it's definitely anyway. possible definitely possible uh i think just, he can do it like everyone else is like oh yeah no this that and they, they just say a bunch of negative stuff about kyle well, i believe kyle with his low level attack i think he can get to the guy's legs finishing's another thing but you don't even have to finish anymore under the current rules i i think that um this is probably what other people are saying i I'm, i don't keep up on it but I think looking at Sajulayev and looking at Kyle, Kyle's not slow, but Sajulayev is so um, so fast twitch um, that 
it's going to be very hard to do the answer that I just gave you to him because he's, he's so, he's so fast and he's athletic. unreal, dude. He's, uh, he's unbelievable. He's so, he's so fast and you have to, and, and Snyder is incredibly strong, but he's not as fast. Um, so no, to, no. To have he's not the fast twitch. His body's just different too. To have to have the the shot and then the finish as quickly as you need to do it is going to be very difficult with how quickly Sejalayev can change his position. All right, you can choose to answer this or not. I don't care, but I got to ask: Are they cheating? Are they cheating? I'm not saying Sejalayev. I think he's well, generational. Why would I, I not? Why would I not answer that? I, that's a, I love the answer. That I too. think they're cheating so hard. They always have, and I don't want to. I don't want to like throw the baby out the bathwater. Say everyone does and everything, because um, you know Satiev didn't look like he was juiced, but but Satiev looked like Paul, or he looked like uh, he looked like Wes. So so um, he looked awful. He looked awful. So, yeah. So so clearly clearly, but I mean, I love you, Wes Bergman. What, what's funny is what's funny is uh, you know they'll say that about some of our jacked up guys like Burroughs and stuff. Um, and uh, anyway, it's Usada, Usada lives with Jordan, with Jordan Burles. Come on. Yeah, yeah. No, so um, and they, they could say that about Snyder. Snyder looks that way too, but Snyder's actually strong. Uh, and, and I guess you are strong too when you take steroids. But you can tell when when I wrestled when I wrestled uh, uh, Gazumov a bunch. Uh, you know, oh I God. had I had his leg in practice, and I'm I'm. I'm pretty strong and You're I was mutant. You're farm machinery. I, I was going to push him out of bounds and he like, you know, like, like, like stopped. And I was like, how, how did he like just stop me from pushing him out of bounds? And, and, uh, Terrell goes, Oh, that was his roid leg. Uh, no, no, that was, <laughs> I was, I was wrestling. This is the most roid leg. I love it. I was wrestling to give, to give, <sighs> uh, if you remember, you remember the, the 74 the, kilo guy. No, 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 no. The, the bigger one, the the one at my weight. Okay. To give, to give he did an arm drag in practice and almost broke, like almost felt like it dislocated my elbow. Dude, they're mutants. Uh, they're arm on drag. top of it. They're mutants. Let's get let's get he did that. Arm drag, the arm drag and put his his head against the my joint to a shot and like and like it felt like he like hit me with with like a a gun the way that he just drilled that. I think he was doing that on purpose. But yeah. um, I was like, his head is huge. Gazumov's head is huge. I don't need to test them. I already I wrestled both of them, and they clearly took steroids. I mean, it's not even and freaking. I wrestled uh, Yazdani at the World Cup. He tech fault. He beats me eight. Worst match. One of my worst matches in international. Kept stepping on your foot. Yeah, he he did. I was sad for you. I'm not gonna lie to you. I love you, but I'm like, why is he letting him step on his foot? Stop it. That was I got twice foot stomped. Like, listen, I. I that was the first match back in a long time. Not to make excuses, but it wasn't. Uh, I wasn't in my A game. And then he stopped the dog tar out of you, dude. And and then he goes to tech fall the Russian 10-0. and then he finds out we're being tested and is wheeled off to the hospital in a stretcher. Which, by the way, if you if that happens, Usada is supposed to follow or Wada is supposed to follow you to the hospital. Which I don't know if they did. But yeah, he's Wada. He's Wada. You're Usada. For sure, cheating guys. I mean, for sure, it's not even funny. I mean, you tech ball the Russian, crazy. then you're going to stretch her. Crazy. It's it's insane. How many times have you wrestled Gutsalov? Never. Never. Only guy that's never that Snyder's never beaten on and he's wrestled multiple times. Only guy I want you to just wrap your brain around that. Gutsalov doesn't get the, the love he should. Because he – remember the year he went up to heavyweight and won Worlds? Mm -hmm. yep. Total mutant, dude. Total mutant. And he's – hey, how about he's been doing it since 2000? He's Crazy. still wrestling. It's insane. Everyone's like, well, what are you talking – I'm like, you literally have no idea about this guy. He's wait, unbelievable. Wait, he's, he's not still competing, is he? He competed – yeah, he was doing a transfer. He was going to do a transfer, and then he ended up didn't, – he didn't do it because he was coaching in Kazakhstan, I believe. Wow. Oh. But yeah, I mean that guy. That guy's incredible. I mean, but you understand though, that guy did it for twenty years, man. That guy did right. it for twenty years. But it's just like, look at our Tar Come on, man. Come on, man. Well, like, that, what, that, that guy's a, that look guy's at a, him. Look that at him. He got stripped of two gold medals, two Olympic gold medals. Dude, he's a superhero. That guy. I mean, and I get it or whatever. I get it, and I get it. I get his deal. I get his. 
get the ooze back, the transfer thing, but he's actually like a caucus guy. I understand that. But the thing with that guy. No, I meant he looks like a superhero. Yeah, I know. I get it. And he still looks good, actually. If you see him now, he's not all deflated and look bad. He still looks good because I follow Time Azov team, Team Time Azov, which is his club. Um, Sadikov is in his club, actually. Sadikov, the guy who won 74 kilos this year in uh, Tokyo. But um, because they're they're Osatian. Uh, Long story short, he's a politician now. But, you know, when he suicide cradled uh, Terval, right? Terrell was beating him. Terrell was, was getting to him, right? And Terrell had beaten him at the World Championships before. Year before. Yeah. And, and, and you know, he's, just, he's picking, he's picking, he's picking. And they got in this just – and Terrell slopped, stopped for a split second. And the dude strapped a cradle up and, like, blind cradled them. Remember it? Yeah. People don't get that. People don't get that. They don't – like, when that's not sitting in front of you and you can't see that, people don't get the level of wrestling these guys are at, man. It's incredible. And I understand he was cheating and he got stripped of that gold, but, and you know, that ultimately it didn't change Terval because I don't even think he cares about the bronze medal that he that earned. But, dude, he stopped for a split second. That's how good these guys are, right? Yeah. It was, it was, hey, it was this. It was literally this. It was that. Probably one of the only people in the world that could do that to Terval. Exactly. I mean, the guy in, and he, he, I don't think he was pinned when they called it. No, either. they didn't. It was, yeah. I, I've watched it. I've rewatched it. Come up first, two different angles on YouTube. But they're cheating. And I'm glad that you answered that, frankly. And, and it was a joke, quite frankly, what UWW did. They gave him the team title this year. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. They gave RWF the team title. Yeah, 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 right. Come on, man. Come on. You know, I mean, there's this massive scandal. You want to be legitimate, and then you still give we them almost, this. We almost still beat them, even though they were cheating. I, I know. It's wild. Yeah, I mean, I love I love where USA Wrestling's at, man. It's been – it's Love so- it. They're doing a fabulous job, man. Oh, Bill Zadek and – Bill's the man. Just, yeah, he's so – Joe great. Russell. Yeah. You know, I'm a KJ guy. A lot of people don't like KJ, though. A lot of people are hard on KJ, man. I think KJ is a real nice guy. Um, I just want to um, Jade. I want. I think Jaden Cox can be really, really, really good. And um, Coach KJ catches a lot of heat for if Jaden doesn't win in the semifinals or Jaden, you know, didn't make weight at the Olympics. KJ catches a lot of that heat. You know what I mean? Hmm. Good guy, though, right? Would you agree? KJ is a good guy. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I like everybody. I don't really have anybody I don't like in wrestling, though. I mean, as far as coaching ability, um, you know, I don't know. Uh, okay. On to Hall of Fame. Let's talk Hall of Fame. You know, we've talked plenty of wrestling. Let's talk about the the football prowess of J.D. Bergman. Sorry to switch gears on you. No, it's fine. we got to wrap up here anyway at some yes. point. Yes. I mean, i got to go to work. At, uh, i got a uh, – the 519, 519 a.m. comes pretty quick when it's <laughs> almost midnight. Uh, JD, talk about football. Um, Oak Harbor, you had all the rushing records. You had all their, you had all their uh, touchdown records. How did you get into football? And talk about the relationship between wrestling and football. Um, I grew up a Notre Dame fan. Wanted to play football for Lou Holtz. Um, that opportunity never was there because Lou, Lou Holtz wasn't coaching at Notre Dame when I got to college. But um, uh I, there was a video of me like doing pushups when I was like eight, eight years old or something. I was playing, say I want to play for, for uh, uh, Lou Holtz or something, but um, I don't know. I mean, I, I started football before wrestling. My dad was really smart. He, he brought us around the wrestling tournaments and it was our idea that we wanted to wrestle because he brought us around some wrestling tournaments. My uncles were doing it, my cousins. So, uh, and then obviously, you know, there's five Bergmans in the varsity lineup at O'Carver at one point, which is really cool. Um, and, um, but football, um, people are surprised to hear this, but after wrestling in 20 some countries and wrestling over 20 years, uh, until I was 31, um, having some great experiences, not just in wrestling, but in like sports broadcasting and, and, uh, acting and these others doors that opened and speaking, 
things that I enjoy by far the most enjoyment I've ever gotten out of a sport is uh, senior year high school football uh, at Oak Harbor. Um, and um, I wanted to play football at Ohio state. I didn't want to wrestle. Uh, football is way more fun, way easier than wrestling. You did play to be fair with everybody. You did play some football. You played in the spring game, right? At the Ohio state. Yeah. I, I was 19. I thought I could do it all. And I wanted to get on a team as soon as possible and give the wrestling scholarship back and get the, get the football scholarship. And I knew I would have started at linebacker or, or fullback. Um, I do not, I'm not naive enough to think that I would have been the running back at Ohio state because I wasn't fast enough. Um, in high school, I mean, no one could tackle me, and I, I had decent game speed with pads. didn't slow me down at all, and I, I could read the field pretty well. I think I did decent on that, um, but I, I got caught from behind a couple of different times. But Pretty fast guys, but, but uh, <laughs> uh, really, really funny stories. Um, but I think, you know, it was partially we were picked fifth in the league, and I, some of my best friends um, in high school – you're familiar with for sure, Dave Bench, Joe Noggle, Greg Van Horn. We did, we came together as leaders and not just them. I, I mean, Zane Gore, Shad Skinner, there's, there there's these guys, we did things and we had literally what you had make football movies about. We had this heart where I think we shared the title in the league. We went a couple of rounds in the playoffs and we had this heartbreaking loss uh, to Akron Hoban, gold shoes, double, double the amount of kids, uh, double double the size. They're the pound for pound best team in Ohio for like the last six years. They're not okay. this year, but they've been the best team in Ohio for the last five six years. Yeah. So we we and and, and we were uh, anyway. Just some, it's funny, but to answer your question, like I don't know. I just um, running people over or like run like like avoid eluding people or hurdling somebody or doing things as a running back. I also really love being a linebacker too. Um, Football was just crazy amount of fun. I mean, so in comparison to wrestling, and I so in my freshman year, I, I got third as a true freshman in wrestling. I wanted to get on a football team, but I had a, a broken hand from the US Open in wrestling, and I had a torn cartilage still in my chest from the NCAA tournament. I tore my cartilage first round, which makes that story even crazier. Came back uh, and took third with torn cartilage. That's crazy. I, I had to shoot it with lidocaine every round. And it, it anyway, so yeah, it was, it was cool, really cool story. Did um, you beat? The current Bellator heavyweight champion, Ryan Bader, in the third and fourth match. Is that who it was? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that he was. The, the, uh, I don't. Hold well, on. Let me see if he's a Bellator champ. I think he is. But keep going. Keep going. I beat, I beat Ryan for third. Um, and uh, But, yeah, so I get on the spring game. It's hilarious. I, I was like, well, I punted in high school, too. My form was terrible. I never had a punting coach, really. So, um, uh, but my good punts in practice, because I couldn't do contact because of my, my cartilage in my hand, I, I was like, well, let me try my, my, you know, my shot at punting. And they let me, Coach Russell let me punt in the spring game because I caught every snap and I had good hands because I, I used to catch uh, passes from the backfield in the flats and stuff. Um, and I loved catching, you know, you know in, as a running back. Well, so I had good hands. I, had, I showed up decently in practice. I had some good ones. I didn't have very good consistency. Um, and uh, he tried to let me punt. And uh, instead, long story short, uh, the snap was into the grass, but I still should have caught it. I bobbled, I bobbled it for a second. And he actually snapped it over my head into the end zone in the, the week before when we were practicing in the horseshoe. And... Um, I got my pump locked in front of like 60 or 70,000 people. Oh, so that was my career. Um, but then, <laughs> that was then it. You know, what's, what's crazy. What's crazy is I was supposed to play football when I redshirted in wrestling, but Russ Helixson wanted me to wrestle again the next year. And then I tore my ACL. I just never got a chance to play. So to really play. So, so you did get to put the uh, Scarlet and gray on for the Scarlet and gray game and actually uh, get your pump locked. Huh? Mm-hmm. That's how it goes. Um, yeah. Who was the coaching staff at Oak Harbor? Was it Gary, Gary Quisner, who's getting inducted as well? For sure, yeah, coach. My Quisner. coach. Oh man, I got yeah. some great Gary Quisner stories. I got some great stories. I might tell a, I might tell a Quisner story. I might st- tell a JD story, and I might tell a Pat story because I got to. I'm inducting Pat. Who's inducting you? Uh, George. George's okay. Well, I'll tell a George story while I'm at it too. Yeah. And uh, coach Coach Osborne is is uh, introducing uh, Coach Quisner. Oh my that. <laughs> Listen, hold on. That's my guy. Oz is my favorite coach of all time. Oz told me how it was. I respect Tom Osborne. 
Yeah. Love Tom Osborne. That's my guy. I love that guy. Tom Osborne is, and you know, the Oz, as we call him, right? And, you know, pacing the sidelines in the short shorts. And his twin brother would be there, uh, Tom. It was – did you ever have Tom, the twin brother? Uh-uh. Oh, man. Awesome. Both played football for the T- University of Toledo. Awesome guys. Tom Osborne, they don't make them better than, than Coach Oz. What's, what's his brother's name? What's his twin brother's name? I'm, I'm not sure. Mike. Mike. Mike's his twin brother. Oh, man. They're awesome. They're awesome guys. But, man, well, okay, so I'll name guys. You tell me if they're on the staff when you were there. Ready? Well, Oz. I right no, Oz. I mean- I mean, Oz, Harsha. Humans. Harsha, rest in peace. Terry Harsha, he passed away recently, one the last yeah. couple of years. Um, great guy. Uh, Wayne Sifke. Was Wayne Sifke on the staff? I don't think so. No. Coach Croy? Um, Coach Croy coached me in junior high, but I don't know if he was on the high school staff. I can't remember. I think he was. I think he did help. Like, Because, you know, junior high staff would come over and help with the high school, like, on the games and stuff. I don't know if he was on staff officially. I'm not George sure. George Bergman. <laughs> no, I don't think No, he no, he's on the staff. He does scouting. He He's the eighth grade coach, and he goes to all the away games. Okay, so that's what – that's see, that's what I don't know. When you say on the staff, I dealt no, with – No, they're this. on the staff. Okay. So yeah, George, so, he's still on the staff, dude. Your yeah. Uncle George still coaches – he's coaching my nephew Bodie this year, and they're pretty good. They did tie Clyde, though. Womp womp. But hold on, I'm thinking of more. Let me think of more. Uh so Wayne Sifke wasn't on. What what can help? What what what's gonna help? Did, did that come through that call? No, we're know. good. Um who is calling you right now? What is happening? This computer is linked to my wife's phone. Yeah, but my, who's calling someone's calling your wife? Probably, probably yeah, probably my wife's twin sister. My wife's got a twin. Mm-hmm. Nice. Okay. Biggest thing, my biggest takeaway, tell me a good story. Tell me a good Quizno, Oz. <laughs> tell me a good story. I know you got one. Oh, yeah, this links back in Wes. Wes is like the highlight of, of this interview. Wes um, is it, man. So Wes, Wes, Wes Bergman, love you. You're the guy. Dude, dude. So we'd go like Thursday walkthrough under the lights, right? Was great. And the, the, the cheerleaders would always like make up the, the locker room with all these treats, especially for the seniors. And, um, the the underclassmen like the the sophomores would have to would have to pick up the the pads after the drills and Wes Wes starts taking off when we get we get released to go back to the locker room Wes starts taking off and coach Quizno sees him and another guy and says and says hey Bergman you know whatever or Wes or, uh, he goes he's like he's like those those pads got your names written all over them and and he goes like like this fast. He goes he goes, what? Who wrote it on there? <laughs> and uh, <sighs> Quizno and, did not like that. No no. And then then he goes, then he goes. You know, I don't start stop being a smart aleck or something. I don't know. But like, oh, yeah. what, it's not what he what, said though. I could yeah. I could, stop I being a smart ass, Wes. Yeah, I couldn't believe how fast of a reaction Wes had. Like, I love it. I love everything about it, dude. It's it is. Who, wrote, by Ling. who wrote on there? Who uh, wrote them on there? Uh, well, okay, so what all records? Did you, you still have records there. I don't think so. Um, no? They, they got the ball to this this fast, this kid that had speed, and he he passed all of them, I think. He broke them all, huh? Yeah. Clay, so. Coach Schulte. Schulte. I don't know. But the, the – um, single season what's interesting is we you really little carver you don't get the ball till you're a senior if i'd have just been the guy but i got i got a starting i had more yards as a sophomore because tracy Gaines and um and harder brandon harder got hurt so i got the ball as a sophomore i had more r- rushing yards as a sophomore but as a as a junior they were giving it to chad thompson and zach levy um and i didn't get the ball very much but my senior year, I finally got the ball, and I had this. So I had a single season rush, rushing record, and I don't know on, on the single single game as well. I think. Okay. And then maybe, maybe I got some. one for you here. Ready? This is the people's champ, Paul Wall. Paul Wall, people's champ. People's champ. Nice. You see it? Yeah. Yeah. After Wyatt won state last year. Look at Paul's man-made. 
Look at that lion's mane head of hair he's got. Yep. Look at that. That's a great picture, isn't it? I love so Paul's in it. I wish he didn't have a silly mask on, but. Yeah, I wish we didn't have to have those. That's things. how it goes. That's hey, We don't need to go down the rabbit hole on that. But uh, hold on. I got I got a couple. I, I got one or two more for you, and then I'm going to let you let you off the hook, okay? Um, ultimately, what do you want people to get out of, like, Hall of Fame, talk about? What, are, what do you want to impart to people, and what do you want them to learn about lessons that you've taken from sport? Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to thank people that helped me, um, along the, the road and, uh, coach, coach E, uh, will be part, part of that. But as far as like in such a short window of time, what can you do? I'll instill some things that maybe could, I, when I speak, I get opportunities to speak. I'm really grateful for that. I want to give people, um, some nuggets of, and, um, ways to, get back to uh, the ability to renew their mind and have critical thought because if you teach people how to think then they can actually have a better future but uh so i'm going to probably challenge them even it, but do some some thanks and then do some things i've learned since my through my sporting career but since then as far as like all right now what did sports prepare me for um helping people have better lives um which starts starts in the mind so um yeah gary quiz the story you ready yeah. So um, Adam Quizno was a freshman when I was a senior. That's his oldest. That's his oldest kid, Adam. Mandy's his daughter. I think Mandy's probably a year or two younger I, than I, Adam. Is Mandy your age? Mm-hmm. You, she's 2003 grad? Mm-hmm. Okay. So he's got these two kids. They're both like middle school, high school. Um, and... I'm in his class one day, and this dude is on the war path, right? This guy drags me out in the hallway, he's screaming at me. He's all over me. And I was the doormat, right? Like the Miller doormat, right? Like I remember just, just like, was if there was a Miller to be mean to, I guess it was me. Was I, like, whatever. I'm not like mad about it or anything. Still, you know, I recovered. I bounced back pretty quick. So this dude just hammers me in the hallway. And it was about like, you don't have your homework or. This cat just put the lumber to me, right? Gary Quizness, he's out there. He's getting full red fury. It's all red. He's getting mad. He's up on me, and he's you know, he's a bigger guy, right? 6'4", or whatever he is, and he is just giving me the business. And I'm like, what is happening right now? It's like when John beat me up with the weed whacker. And listen, dude, I'm not always innocent. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm always innocent. I'm not, right? But, like, the John beating me up at the weed whacker and Gary Quisno dragging him out in the hallway and almost ripping my hat off. I was innocent in both of those, okay? So, I remember – oh, Hubens. Was Hubens on the – Bill Hubens, was he on the coaching staff? Yep. Dude, that man has silk lips. That man has got a golden tongue. He has silver tongue, right? Like, that guy can talk. He's awesome. So, I remember I was, like, talking about it, and Bill Hubens overheard me, and he's like, Zeb, you remember this day? You remember this day? And I was like, all right. And uh, Coach Quizno was blessed with another daughter, and I believe he found out that day. So he was <laughs> he was on a little bit of a war path, and I was in the way. Uh, so you know he has a daughter that's like 15 yeah, or 16 years younger than Mandy, right? You know that, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not 15 or 16, but. Yeah, no, 14, 15, or something crazy like that. Yeah. So I was the uh, sacrificial lamb that day, 12 years, whatever it is. <laughs> I was the sacrificial lamb for Gary Quizno that day because he was pissed. You got some – some. Uh, I'm not innocent a lot, though. I, I deserve everything I get on a lot of these. I'm not going to lie to you. The beating, beating me up with the weed whacker, John Bergman, come on, dude. Gary Quizno, you're, uh, you're un <laughs> – your unintended rage for me. Come on, man. <laughs> I'll get to talk to him about it Friday. Or sa- yeah. was it Saturday? Yeah, Saturday. Oh, You're not going yeah. to the game, are you? Yeah, they're recognizing us after the first Oh, they game. are? Yeah. Am I supposed to go to that? I don't know. I don't think I'm going to. Yeah. I'm not going to. George will be there, though. He'll be taking stats. Don't worry. Yeah. Did you get him on the sidelines? You're going to sideline it up? You're going to get all broed up and get all get all pumped up or what? I'll probably be there for the first half. I don't know. I'm, nice. Right. And then mom and dad live in Perrysburg. They don't live in Oak Harbor anymore, do they? Perrysburg, yep. All right. All right, JD. 
Do you have anything else for me? Is there anything I should expect that should be special at the Hall of Fame induction at Oak Harbor High School for the Athletic Hall of Fame between you, Pat Kane? You got a Pat Kane story? Maybe you know what? Do you want to hear a Pat Kane story? Well, I mean, I, I mean, look, I looked up to you and Pat, and um, I'm a huge fan of Gary Quisno and, and Coach Osborne and and Hugh Bins and Harshaw and um, and actually Kelly Croy. Kelly um, Croy, I like Kelly Croy. I'm a Kelly Croy guy. I'm not gonna lie to you. I, I invited him. He's at my table. Love him. Great guy. Yeah. Um, Great guy. Awesome yeah, guy. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we speak together at some point. He Love it. Awesome trap. guy, man. Awesome yeah. guy. Good cat. Uh, pure heart. Pure heart cares about kids. I'm a big Kelly Croy fan. Uh, Pat the Canyon. Thing, the thing I think about Pat is, I mean, a freak of nature. I mean, he just strong, strong as crazy. But and then and then your other friend, Wellbacher, seeing those Wellbacher, guys, yeah, Tommy, Tommy, seeing those guys wrestle when I was, you know, in junior high, seeing those two battle, like and how strong I knew Pat was. And then Wellbacher grabbed his, his arms one time at the Galleon district and shoved Pat off the mat with his arm, with his own arm. I was like, Holy crap. What's funny is I ended up wrestling. Uh, Tommy came in and wrestled Ohio state uh, with me uh, at some point. So I wrestled Pat when I was in high school. I wrestled Tommy later, uh, you know, and practice sometimes. So it's, it's a small world as usual. You've handed a lot of beatdowns out. Likely over. <laughs> no, I know. You, I remember I came back in college. I was wrestling. You were like a junior or senior in high school. I kept going after you, and you kept like your hips were cement, and I couldn't take you down as a college guy. I was so mad. But the crazy thing about it is like a year later, two years later, you're an All-American. So it's like that felt a little better. I was like, eh, high school kid just beat me. That's just kind of inexcusable. Oh, he's all American next year. Okay, it's not as bad. Doesn't hurt. That didn't hurt as bad. My uncle George asked me all these questions. I do literally did not like. I wouldn't have known if you if you beat me or I, if I beat you. And same thing with Pat. He he asked me, did I beat Pat when Pat would come back from Bowling Green? I don't know. I I I know you, that you I beat like would wrestle. Like, you got me. <laughs> I know I. Re- I'd wrestle like Zeitstein and Detroit and like these older guys. I mean, um, and, you were, you were and body bagging run. those guys. Or they were waiting until so, you were so tired <laughs> that they could get with yeah, licking yeah. on you. But I just, I just, I didn't remember if, if, uh, you know, th- some of the questions he had for me, I did, just didn't remember. But, um, but that's cool. I, I mean, Think I about you and Pat, guys like you and Pat. You're the type of guys like the Scott Green's the associate head coach at uh, Army West Point. And he tells a story about uh, hanging off a cliff, right? He's holding on to tree roots. He's hanging off a cliff. You hear a person coming up over the cliff. You can't see them, right? They come up over the cliff and you see who it is and you recognize your mind processes it. You two are the type of guys that I know I'm getting pulled up. I'm getting pulled up off the cliff. I know there's not going to be any excuses. I know that you're going to drop whatever you have to come pull me up off the cliff, Mm -hmm. right? Don't ask me how I got on the cliff, right? Don't ask me how I'm hanging off on the tree roots. But the biggest thing is like guys like you guys, you can always count on them. There are guys you can always count on them. There's not a gimmick. There's no nonsense. They want to help you out. They're pretty genuine. And if they don't want to help you out, Pat Canyon and JD Bergman don't want to help you out. They'll tell you. Mm-hmm. They're never going to piss on your shoes and tell you it's raining. I like that about the, you guys. You know what I mean? There's no, that's right. That's a genuine, that's a good, that's a good quality of people. Right. Yeah. yeah. I like that. I'm a big fan of that. So, all right. You got anything else for me? No, no, I, nope. I just say to anybody listening still, uh, if they are, um, just guard, guard your eye gates and your ear gates, be real, real disciplined with with what goes in there. I love it because listen, you're getting a lot of, uh, brain pinball from Instagram, Twitter, and the Facebook. Is that correct? Yeah. The Snapchat too. The Snapchat, the Snapchat's a big one. Because the kids have moved to the Snapchat, but if you, hey. if, if you listen to what the world tells you about you more than what the word tells you about you, your life's going to be really hard, a lot harder than it needs to be. JD Bergman, thank you for coming on the Barbarian Hour. Check out Barbarian Apparel at www.barbarianapparel.com. Stick around, JD.